Good evening, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Andrea Green, Director of the Visiting Artist Program here at SAC, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's lecture by visiting artist Arlene Chiquette. SAC's Visiting Artist Program hosts a variety of artists, designers, and scholars each academic year to foster a greater understanding and appreciation of contemporary art. And we are so honored to have Arlene um, visit SAC, and I would like to thank her for taking the time to be here and to share her work with all of us this evening. I would also like to thank the Robert Lehman Foundation and the Illinois Arts Council Agency for their support of tonight's program. You can find additional information about the Visiting Artist Program um, by visiting our website at saac.edu backslash VAP, and you can find bios on upcoming guests, um, articles, and also um, download podcasts of previous lectures as well. At the end of tonight's lecture, we'll take a few questions from the audience. Our staff will have microphones circulating, so please raise your hands so we can get to you in your question. And also, please join us again next Monday, same place, same time, um, on March 16th, when we welcome visiting designer Graham Pullen. So thank you again for joining us tonight. Now I'd like to welcome to the podium Kitty Ross, professor and chair of SAC's Ceramics Department for the introduction. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. We're so excited to welcome Arlene Chiquette to Chicago tonight. Arlene received a BA degree from New York University and her MFA from the Rhode Island School of Design. She's received many honors, some of which I'm going to list now. Uh, the American Academy of Arts and Letters Award in Art, and an, the Anonymous Was a Woman Individual Artist Award, Joan Mitchell Foundation Painters and Sculptors Grant, the US State Department American Artists Abroad in Vietnam, the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Visual Artist Fellowship, the New York Foundation for the Arts Artist Fellowship Grant, and an NEA in Visual Art, the Artist Fellowship Grant. Chiquette is currently featured in season seven of the PBS award-winning series, Art 21. This summer, Gregory Miller Company and uh, DAP, the di distributed art publishers, will publish a book based on her solo exhibition at the RISD Museum titled Meissen Recast, which focused on work that the artist made during her residency at the historic Meissen porcelain factory in Germany and her reinstallation in the museum's decorative arts department. A few of her upcoming shows in the near future include um, the Jewish Mu Museum in New York City, CAM, the Contemporary Art Museum in St. Louis, the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C., and a retrospective at the Institute of Contemporary Art, Boston. Chiquette's desire for imperfection combining with trusting ugliness in the studio process results in work that is sensuous, humorous, and elegant, repulsive and attractive, chaotic and controlled. Combining hand building techniques with casts of bricks and slip casting molds from industry, she investigates the traditions of decorative arts while testing the limits of those materials and practices. She has received international recognition for her experimental approach and stunning objects. Arlene lives in New York City and Woodstock, New York. Please join me in welcoming her tonight. Hi, everybody. Wow, Chicago is amazing for art. I'm so excited to be here. I've been, I arrived yesterday and I've seen a huge amount of art and uh, you guys are lucky to be here and imbibe that um, great stuff all the time. I hope you take advantage of it, it's amazing. Anyway, um, so I just wanted to uh, begin with a little bit of a disclaimer, something you already know. But um, the fact that anyone who stands on this stage is presenting a highly edited version of their work. Some things simply do not fit into a basic narrative that must be delivered in one hour. 
and a lot of bad stuff gets made. That, that bad stuff is necessary, but needs then to be discarded. You're not gonna see that much of it. Um, it is not simple or easy to make art, and I do not want you to feel alone if you're struggling. This is just a talk, a glimpse of some of the things that made it out of my studio in one piece. Okay, so um, what I decided to do tonight is start uh, by trying to pull together a, just a bit of a trajectory from the last 20 years um, to give you a sense of how things developed. Because when I was a student, I couldn't figure out how one ends up with a body of work, as it was called. Um, and so I still don't really understand it, and all you have to do is follow your nose, but I'm going to tell you how it ended up that I followed um, my instincts in moving from one thing to the other. So this, what you're looking at here is a plaster and paint piece from um, maybe 22 or 23 years ago. Uh, and uh, at that time, I, my best friend died. So death was very present in my life and I was also having babies. So I had the, the real sense of urgency um, and focus regarding all things uh, life and death. And so as death came flooding in, um, I became aware that the only way for me to deal with the overwhelming sadness and trauma that I was feeling was to live my life in the studio in a more alive way. So I discarded pretty much everything that I had been working on, anything that involved armatures, anything that involved pre-thinking, and I decided to be in the studio in a state of just being completely present. So this work is made without um, an armature um, and with the idea that I was just working with time, whatever was presented to me at that particular moment in time. Um, I had a Buddhist teacher who kept on telling me that my time, uh, when, I, when he would suggest that I meditated and then I would suggest that I had not a moment to do that, and then he would say, oh, but your time in the studio is your meditative time, and I would say, you are so wrong, it's not like that. Uh, and then we went through a lot of uh, wrangling and I finally set, decided uh, when I went hysterically crying about my the loss of my um, friend, and he said, don't make such a big deal out of it. Uh, death is present all of the time. Uh, I decided that yes, he was right, and yes, uh, instead of fighting with him, not that he had the right idea about what was going on in my studio, but I could make the right idea happen in my studio. And so this, the following work um, started to happen there. Here's uh, working with this sloppy material. Uh, and so these pieces made made without armatures were really um, made uh, sort of as performance pieces for myself in that it was the process of making them that was important to me. And I, I worked for a year or two without showing or telling anybody what I was doing. Um, and so they're more or less solid plaster. Uh, 
as time went on, I started to throw chunks of styrofoam in every once in a while in order to make them lighter because they were really heavy. But I would put them down on whatever um, furniture I happened to have around, and I had uh, this collection of discarded furniture from the streets of New York. And so that ended up by being the um, pedestal, as it were, uh, for these pieces. Um, and so even though the first pieces I w made were very blobby and had no form, I ended up by seeing in them, I, because I had this Buddhist frame of mind, uh, a Buddha, and never in my life did I ever think I would make an icon. Uh, or anything even close to that. But um, I realized at that point when by chance I made something that looked to me like a Buddha that having these icons, I would make one and I would put it down and put another one down and I'd go into the studio and it actually did two things. It reminded me what my enterprise was, what my resolve was. So I saw that icons were really that in the world. They were reminders. And it, they also made me feel better. So um, the I had, before I started making these, I had been painting. And I had been making painting without canvases, so can, sheets of, sheets of uh, color and paint that were uh, painted on glass, peeled off, and, and shown like that. And so I had all these paint skins around. So they became embedded in the plaster as I was making the things. And at first, as I was applying them or building them into the pieces, I was thinking, you know, I should clean my hands or do something. But the whole thing was was had this sense of urgency. And then I realized that my my hands full of plaster on the pieces were like the drawing that was happening on top and within the pieces. And, um, and so that, um, I think I've always made things where the uh, finished piece reveals the process uh, that um, has been involved in, in creating that piece, but, um, I was learning. I was really aware. I was sad, but I was very felt that I was um, finally doing work that may that with this very like urgent material because plaster is something of a timekeeper. It goes from li from powder to liquid to to a solid within the course of a minute or two, and so I just was living this um, this transformation constantly, and it was really um, exciting for me. <clears throat> it was less exciting when I started to um, show people what was happening in the studio, and uh, and then people, I, I, it was hard, to explain that I wasn't really so attached to that finished product as I was attached to the process that um, I was involved in on a daily basis and what it was teaching me. So um, instead of instead of being called the Buddha woman, which is what, like, star, oh, you're the person who makes Buddhas, I didn't want to be so identified with that. I wanted to broaden that conversation a little bit. And um, I was deep into Asian art history anyway, and began to study stupas. And a stupa is um, an arch architectural manifestation of an enlightened mind, a kind of temple, a reliquary, and in many ways, a it, it held the bones of the Buddha, and in many ways, a um, building about death that was also a pilgrimage site and a very alive place. So, um, so this is a stupa. 
and I just love, love stupas as sculptures. Um, I made a trip to Borobudur, which is the largest stupa in the world in Indonesia. And as you climb up uh, this stupa, the, the story of the Buddha is um, told in sculpture, you know, sculptural forms. It's a completely sculptural teaching and very exciting to me. Um, the other exciting thing is that as I started to study stupas, I looked at the plans, the, the architectural plans, like how did these forms become, uh, come into life, and I discovered that mandalas uh, were actually used as the blueprint, as the plan, for um, stupas. And so all of my ideas about what a mandala was, or a mandala, uh, you know, hippie diagram went out the window, and I realized that, that a mandala was really a cloak, you know, a, a kind of a real place that one could visit, an, a real architecture of the mind, a place that one could visit in their minds, and that you walk in one door, and there's a whole ceremony that one goes through. And I wanted to do work that celebrated that idea, um, and, uh, and put the architecture back in the mandala. So I made them blue and white, referencing the idea of um, blueprint. And um, the situation that I found myself in was that I was offered a, a grant um, for, from a place called Judene, which is a paper mill um, in New York City. And so, uh, that's the work I did there. So this is not a drawing or a painting on a piece of paper. This is actually cast blue and white paper. So the paper is the thing. And for me, that was super important. Um, so it's just blue paper and white paper put together to make this thing. Um, and this is sort of and, and it's all done in liquid pulp. And um, I became, I'm still doing work in that, using um, at Judene, different kind of work, but it was a very uh, good avenue for using this um, idea of the stupa because, and the stupa plans and the architecture, because at the same time that we think of architecture as something solid, something about a building, the process of using the paper mill, of using the liquid paper, created these air bubbles, which in typical paper making, one bursts the air bubbles, takes them out of the image. But I made the air bubbles part of the image um, so that the actual process was revealed, but also, um, you know, it's a whole other layer of of drawing information that 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 just occurred, and that had that same fluid um, visual language that was also in the plaster pieces. So I sh often showed these works together. That, that uh, liquid paper in blue gave me another association. And I'm not talking about like I did it for a day or two and then I got this idea. I'm talking about a year or two. Um, of working with this blue pulp and, and white pulp and make, working out. I mean, it took me a long time to even work out how to make fine lines and do drawings and all, all of that stuff. And I'm just going to skip right over that. And if anybody wants to know, you can ask me later. Uh, but, um, but I did get an idea, and I think that image I showed before of that wet, glistening, uh, blue, you know, 
uh, after many times of experiencing that, um, the notion of glaze came into uh, my, uh, into sight for me, I, and I just started to think about blue and white porcelains, which I had never, I would say never thought about, never, ever, ever thought I would be interested in them. Um, and uh, there's a Buddhist principle of aversion, um, and to work with aversion, that if you feel completely averse to something, um, that might be a, an interesting thing to move towards. Uh, so, or at least be open to, to examine one's aversion. I was averse to blue and white porcelain uh, and, you know, flowers and butterflies and stuff like that. But the, I became obsessed with the idea of taking these flat plans and making them into three-dimensional forms. In other words, taking the, the flat plans were plans of a three-dimensional space and I wanted to, take, to make them three-dimensional again, uh, but on a domestic scale. And I um, created, I decided that the vase was the same thing as a stupa, that on a domestic level, so that the vase acts as a domestic form of sacred architecture, um, and you know, circular, um, a place to put ashes, a place to put flowers, a place to remember um, within a domestic environment. So I made, it was a crazy process, um, and I made, uh, I had somebody help me make ceramic, thrown ceramic forms. Um, stupas exist all over Asia, and that was the other thing that interested me. They're a big east-west language, and they exist all over Asia, and now, of course, there are some in the United States as well. But I was interested in some ceramics that, from all of the different locations that also had stupas. And I would choose a shape. I'd have some, I drew it, and then I'd have a potter throw that thing. Then I would make a plaster mold and make plaster positive. And because that's what you need, you can't cast a piece of paper. You have to wrap it around the shape and the, the paper shrinks on the shape and then you have to figure out how to get it off. Uh, so you can see there's the mold on the left and, and then there's the thing. And then the thing, out of desperation, one day I um, was gonna have a show in LA and uh, I knew I just was going for the vases but I couldn't figure out how I was going to show it exactly. Um, this gallery had a big square, it was a big square, it was almost a cube in fact, it was really great and I knew I wanted to create the circular stupa um, but as I was making each piece, I would put them down on their mold, and suddenly I looked at it and I'm like, I guess that's the answer. So, uh, so that is the an that was the answer, and I made a um, hundred of those, and they required, in order for people to see the piece, they required that one walk all the way around, and so even without me saying, oh, please walk around as if you were walking around a stupa, because what you do at a stupa site is you literally circumambulate, you literally walk around it in order to gain enlightenment. So I didn't have to say that, that people were forced into that dance. They were forced into doing that by the circumstance of my installation, and uh, it worked pretty well. So each one of those is a deconstructed temple. <clears throat> uh, 
basic, basically, I uh, decided also about 20 years ago to accept most situations I was invited to participate in. Uh, that overthinking, over editing, um, and becoming precious about all of that didn't make any sense to me. That if I, that I, that part of my enterprise would, or all of my enterprise would benefit from me putting myself in situations. So I feel a lot that I have learned from situations. My work has grown, I have grown as a person from being sometimes in uncomfortable situations, but often in situations that embrace generosity and learning in a very moving way. And so I was invited to um, this place called Pilchuk, which is this glass place. Um, and I had never worked in glass, but it was like uh, they gave me this queen for a day sort of situation um, where, you know, I had a full-time assistant and I could do whatever I wanted. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to, I had a commission at that time to, and I, I ended up doing it in cast glass and we don't have time for me to show all the cast glass, but the, I, I also had never even thought about blowing glass. But um, I got involved in doing that, but also watching it endlessly with interest and realized that a lot of, I was just became very aware of, of the glass blowing situation as a choreography. And, uh, and this working with other pe people and it, it was interesting to me how people work together very wordlessly and also how people were constantly talking about their breath. Uh, and that glass was basically substance surrounding air. And um, so I glommed onto that uh, idea and um, got you know, made work about that that I don't have time to show, um, but will be in my survey show, and uh, I. But I kept I kept that information, and uh, I worked in I did a lot of glass stuff. And let me just say, a lot of these things are overlapping. So when I worked with the paper, I was still working with the plaster, and when I worked with, started working with clay, I still was doing some glass stuff. But I, so it's not, you know, it's not clean what, what, uh, what actually happened or happens ever. Um, and so uh, the thing about the glass that I didn't like was it wasn't body to body enough for me. I needed to be more hands-on. I needed to be messier. And I also felt that glass in my aesthetic uh, was too beautiful. It, it was so beautiful that it's really hard to make anything with it because it immediately was like, oh yeah, this is gorgeous, done. You know, uh, so so I felt a little bit that that was dangerous. Uh, and I am a studio artist, and I like to be able to work often by myself. And I was searching around for something. And um, I had worked in ceramics, but had, you know, early on, but had not in, you know, 15 or 20 years. and. Uh, and so I, but some situation presented itself, um, like somebody gave me some clay and I started to work with it and I thought maybe this is really it because it was so elemental, like everything about it, everything I knew about it in my head uh, went away and just my experience of the material th that it was so elemental became really appealing. And now this is, you know, eight years ago, and it was so marginalized. It was so 
wrong to be working with clay, uh, that it was super attractive to me for that reason. Uh, so I like, I like working on the margins of stuff. I mean, of course, glasses too, you know, everything. But uh, I like working on the margins because I feel like there's a lot of opportunities there. Um, and it's so silly when ideas are formed around materials because they're just materials. So I, um, so I started to work in clay and found, because in working in clay, one has to make things hollow. You can't fire something if it's not hollow. So the whole, my, my, my love of the glass of form surrounding air was right there with the clay. And so that hollowness, that air, that breathing, um, the forming of the thing out of this wet, mushy material, the formlessness of the material, it was all there, and so um, so that you know, this is from 2006 or 2007, uh, and uh, this too. And then I decided at that point also that I would just use glaze because one of the there was a, you know a moment when I thought, oh, well, I guess I sh I could pay, just paint it. Uh, and then I just set a restriction for myself. No, just just use glaze because that's one of the things that can't be. Nothing, nothing else has glaze. Nothing else is made with glaze. And the idea of that skin, the surface and the form becoming one thing, was uh, again related to this paper stuff that I had done, um, and was. Uh, you know, really uh, attractive to me that that it, ha it was both fragile and very strong, and 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 had this this crazy vocabulary of possible colors and and finishes. So then I had a, an exhibition, and uh, I'll just show some works from that. Uh, so you know, I. I was trying to give, I was trying, I didn't want to just, at that point, I also liked the very marginalized idea of have, having this stuff have a relationship to a vessel, which is again, like, no, 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 don't do that. So, uh, so I like that, and so I wanted to retain that. Uh, that history, like it's not just making abstract sculpture, I'm making abstra abstract sculpture within a trajectory, a historical trajectory of what has happened with that material. Uh, and within that, I was just trying to make things that were both beautiful and ugly and creepy and wrong and right and, you know, uh, and clay could do all of that. So these are just some process shots, I, I was like, in order to figure out how to do it, I was building structures within the pieces because in a lot of ways I was asking the works, that, that mushy material to do things it wasn't necessarily pr prepared to do, like cantilever crazily and lean and, and, and uh, slump, but still make it through the firing. So, I mean, I did lose a lot of pieces, but I did, you know, figure it out over time. Um, and uh, my relationship to classical Indian sculpture started to emerge in terms of all of the um, language of the arms or phalluses or like they're all these things, limbs. Uh, um, and spouts, so I was trying to have those things be everything. So, at, so one could read it as, you know, a natural form, or one could read it as arms, or one could read it as, as penises, or whatever you feel like, or, you know, uh, Shiva, but to me, you know, I like that hybrid language. Uh, and also, I like the language of uh, 
of the that you would see that it was hollow. It was really that those those um, apertures allow you to see that the thing is hollow, and I wanted the hollowness to become apparent. Um, I decided tonight to put in a bunch of references to interrupt the the stream here of my own work to, with things I was looking at that had nothing to do directly, it seemed. But to me, this Glitter and Doom show that was at the Met uh, of uh, war uh, work, artwork, mostly painting, be or maybe all painting, between uh, World War I and World War II, uh, that, uh, this is Otto Dix, a, a huge hero of mine. Um, and, he, and, and he had been a hero before, but suddenly when this show came up and I looked at these paintings, I had this experience of sending my assistant over. I was like, go see them. They're like drawings for my works. And she went, I said, that's exactly what I'm doing. And she came back and she said, you're out of your mind. I don't see that at all. But it doesn't matter if somebody else sees it. It's just like I would look at them and I would be very excited and inspired by the, you know, the, the pathos and the humor being merged together, the way the color was used, um, George Gross. The proportions, like this is amazing, Otto Dix drawing, you know, little, and I was working a lot with small on the bottom, big on the top, to accentuate the precariousness of the pieces I was making. I wanted them to feel dangerous. I wanted them to feel like they could just hit you, you know, fall over and hit you on the head. So uh, I feel like that about this drawing. Uh, and. And, and then, you know, I had long been an admirer. I'm not just showing this because I'm in Chicago. But, uh, you know, I love the Harry Who and all those guys, but Jim Nutt, I think, and Otto Dick, I know that he has to be thinking about that stuff too. Uh, but, you know, I, again, I would look at this and I'd say, oh yeah, that's, a, that's like a drawing for my pieces. Because I don't like to draw for my pieces. I draw afterwards, but if I draw before, that's sort of breaking my rule of being completely present with what I'm doing. I don't want to be trying to follow an outline of something. Um, and here's some other things taken from my studio wall the other day, some news photographs, uh, dancers, and you can see, I think, maybe or not, uh, how I could see these things as sculptures. That's one sculpture. Uh, and, and then, you know, very classic, classical works by Mayo that I just love. This is in front of the Louvre and, and teetering, falling off of the edge, but, you know, I don't, I don't think what I'm doing is so new, and, but it's really great for me to experiencing the, experience these works with fresh eyes. <clears throat> Medardo Rosso, always been a favorite, and was um, a favorite and actually a teacher for Rodin, and here's a Rodin that I love, uh, not your typical Rodin, but um, I think it's amazing. Back to me. Uh, and, and so here, here's some of the stuff that's happening. A lot of people started talking about how I was using pedestals. And by the way, I have always been doing that. Uh, so I have had a long-term interest in architecture. And I work with a lot of materials. And so I had a lot of stuff around. And um, I just started shuffling it. And if you make um, th 
th it, these became objects, and if you make those things, um, for me, they needed to be at very specific heights. I wanted them to have a very specific, it's not just about me, it's about how these things are experienced in the world, and I want, the view, I want them to be at a specific height in relationship to the viewer, and if I want that, I've got to create that. So a lot, that's what the, you know, the stands or pedestals or whatever, the furniture, or I prefer to call it the architecture of the works. I also um, cannibalize my own work. So, you know, there's a plaster part on one, uh, on the left, that inspired the work on the right. Um, this is Elvis. Uh, which I'm happy to say lives in Chicago. Uh, and this is, you know, an installation view of a show, uh, hmm, 2010. Uh, <clears throat> at which point, during the year before that show, I was had to repair my kiln, rebuild my kiln, and I was taking the kiln bricks out and looking at them. And I'd also been having a series of catastrophic failures with ceramic work, and I started thinking, why don't I just glaze these? Uh, so I did. And also, got me to be able to engage as a painter because I think you can see that paint you know having this possibility of being of doing both painting and sculpture is really important Glaze. So this is this is a uh, picture of uh, some shelves and the ceiling in my studio, and uh, the glaze stuff does not happen easily. I glaze. I, I make hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tests every year to develop the, pa the palette or my possibilities. And then of course, when I actually use it on a big surface, it's, it's a completely different thing. Or Thursday, it's different than Monday or something like that. But it gives me a ballpark and I make these tests and then, and then have them, have the results written on little tags and uh, then I have them written down in books and, uh, so it's, it's a big research thing that I love and hate. Uh, here is a piece uh, glazed but unfired, and here it is, fired. So the other thing about doing this work is that what you see is not what you get. So the kind of mental exercise of painting with gray powders and trying to see orange and pink and blue and all of that, that is, is both magical and frustrating. And uh, so I don't know what else to say about it, but it, you know, it, it's, it's, I have a constant push-pull relationship with it, attraction, repulsion, like, God, when I go to painter studios and they start talking technical problems, I'm like, please. <laughs> uh, so, anyway, the the 23. This is just like right out of the book. The 23 uh, is really right out of the box. Is uh, 2300 degrees. So the I, I ended up liking that again, like, oh, that's like the drawing on the brick. The other, the other thing that's uh, super important to me is 
the sculpture experience of things not uh, looking the same from every different viewpoint. So uh, that I can't overstate. You know, it's like the old fashioned. I did teach for a long time and really came to understand how that language of uh, movement around the piece that sculpture offers so much, so much excitement um, in, to the viewer and to the maker in that one can walk around and have a completely different experience with what is in front of them. Um, so uh, right now, we're not looking at one of my sculptures. We're looking at my roof, the roof of my studio last week. Uh, where I, I, I do find inspiration in growing things and looking at what's growing and changing in that way every single day. And then, so I'm taking a break with some more information of things I'm looking at, Philip Gustin, or things I have looked at, um, Joseph Boy's uh, loving that fat, uh, early Claus Oldenburg, <clears throat> Myron Stout, and uh, Kali. I have this little fierce woman hanging in my studio. Uh, this is a little, a little view of my studio before my last show. Okay, uh, so I'm in New York City, but I'm also uh, work four days a week at a studio upstate now for the last six or seven years. And uh, that experience has in so many ways informed uh, the work. So this is the, from that show. And I'm not going to talk that much about it because you just want to see it, and I have too many slides. Here's that piece that I think we saw in its unglazed, in its raw state, in that last video. But this is what I mean that this, you know, this, and then that is pretty different. But, and if you kept walking around it, you would see it completely change. And nothing is more fun for me than doing that. So that's the kiln, that's what I was talking about. For those of you who don't know, those kiln bricks. Um, and that's one of the pieces in the kiln. So the, a couple of years ago that those bricks started to go from the underneath they started to migrate into the piece. So that's uh, one of the things that's happening. Concurrent with making this work, I was beginning, I, I was beginning to work um, in Germany. Not just beginning, the whole time of making this work, I was also commuting back and forth to Germany where I was working at the Meissen porcelain factory. Again, this was another 
opportunity that was afforded me um, and seemed sort of crazy. I'd never worked in porcelain, uh, but it was like that, uh, but they offer, I didn't have to design anything. I didn't have to make anything. I, they just gave me a studio. They weren't asking me to produce something. Um, and so it just seemed, you know, too good uh, to turn down. And it was in a weird part of the former East Germany, right near Dresden. And for those of you who don't know, Dresden has some of the most amazing art in the world. Um, you know, in the, the the that those kings just there's more Dutch painting in Dresden than there is in the Netherlands. Uh, there, you know, they, they just inhaled the world's art, and it's all still there because before the war they they buried them in caves. So the city got bombed, but all the art is alive. So I got a chance to be in this art environment that I had only heard about. And, and that's it. I had an apartment up at the castle. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty crazy. 16th century town. And that is literally where they, the um, Augustus is strong imprisoned the alchemist in, uh, in 1710. They figured out how to make porcelain, which was known as white gold. More more important than gold. Uh, Europeans had porcelain fever. They couldn't get enough of it. They, all of the royalty were, they were bankrupting their governments, uh, buying porcelain from China and Japan, where of course it had they had figured that out hundreds of years ago, uh, hundreds of years before, and if not thousands. Uh, and so they were buying up these things and literally becoming uh, bankrupted. And so there was a big excitement to figure out how to make that in the, on the European continent. And in this factory I was at was the first place in Europe in 1710 where they figured it out, and it's it's crazy. It's amazing. Um, so the town is on the left, and the factory's on the right. And then that was my studio, or one of them. This is uh, uh, the mold. So everything is slip cast there, meaning liquid porcelain into plaster molds to make stuff, like pretty much everything. Um, and I had had almost, I had had very little experience ever doing that or even completely understanding that. But, <clears throat> um, and I didn't know what I was going to do there. But after about 10 days, I realized it was going to be working with the mold in various ways. And so what I ended up doing um, is on the right, it's a shellacked original mold from Meissen uh, that was made out of plaster, shellacked, that I shellacked. And on the left is my mold of that mold. So I made molds of their molds, then I cast those molds into porcelain. That's mine. So that I ended up doing this whole, like using the industrial language of the mold, painting it as if it was Baroque uh, to some extent, and, but casting in every mark. So those are all the numbers, the category, the um, catalog numbers that are in the, P, the mold. Uh, you can see all of the knife marks from when the workers were cutting the molds apart. In, that's wet porcelain. That's my piece, wet porcelain. And then that's my piece on the right, fired. Um, so 
If you don't completely understand it, that's okay. I, uh, I cast the straps that hold the mold together. Um, and I realized that while I was making this work and going back and forth between Germany, I was ha this was having a huge impact on what I was doing in my studio. So you can sort of see, of course, I only really re realized that um, six months ago when we were organizing this show that's about to happen. But, you know, those straps started appearing and uh, there we go. It was very uh, difficult and fun working there. That's, that there's pulling a mold apart. Uh, and everything I made was, of course, a much larger scale because it was, I was casting from the molds, which are way larger than the finished pieces. Uh, and uh, anyway, this is a porcelain room, a historic porcelain room at the Rhode Island School of Design Museum. And by chance, while I was uh, visiting, I, I ran into at the Freeze Art Fair, uh, the director of the museum who asked me what I was doing while I was on furlough from the Meissen factory. And I said what I was doing and he said, oh, we have some Meissen. And I said, oh God, uh, I wanna see it, I wanna get a hold of it. Uh, I wanted to, he said, okay, come, you know, anyway, he, they ended up, I ended up doing a big show um, of that work and reinstalling, in fact, rediscovering that they thought they had about 70 pieces of porcelain from Meissen, and really they had 250. Uh, because, you know, the, that was sort of a dead area of the storage that people hadn't really gone into. And I do think this falls a little bit into uh, deal with what you're averse to because porcelain figurines, no, I was not attracted to that, but you know, I'm in love now. Uh, and so, so the, uh, so I asked if I could do the installation in the porcelain room, if I'd like take everything else out of the porcelain room and reinstall completely um, using only my sin stuff along with my own stuff and then they gave me a contemporary gallery where I did an installation where I inserted some historical pieces into the contemporary so it was a real cross fertilization I think that's what uh, they were talking about in terms of the book that's going to come out soon uh, this is how the monkey band is typically displayed. And this was my installation. So, uh, so you know, I just like took everything apart and uh, reimagined it to come alive in the way that I felt, I felt they were originally made actually by, they're so imaginative and uh, so, beautifully considered both as painting and sculptures that, uh, and they're just hilarious. So dark, also sort of have a darkness, like some, something a little dark and weird, which I love, and, and, and also funny and light. And then this is like a few glimpses from the porcelain room where I, they had never, they had all these accession dishes, which they had never like, oh, we're never gonna show dishes. And when I was at the porcelain factory, I insisted on most of the pieces I made uh, merged dishware, functional dishware uh, with figures, which, which is what they call the art so that I was trying to break down in the final works that I made, that kind of dichotomy that I think we're still in conversation about uh, in this world.
So, you know, I was taking these little figures and putting my porcelain bricks in there. Uh, those are pieces that I made, pieces that Meissen made. Uh, like I took that little saucer because I was like, oh, the bottom of that little saucer all worn. That's just like a perfect Agnes Martin painting or something, <laughs> you know, so, so, something. something. Uh, that's, a, that's a thing that we should look at. Uh, they had... <laughs> They had a they had a Buddha they were trying to deny was even Mycin. Uh, anyway, and then I all when I was still working there, I knew I was going to do this show. So then I was starting to riff off of some of the painting that I knew I could put together. So the belly of the vase there. It's one of the first molds that was ever made at the Mycin porcelain factory. And then this is in the contemporary gallery. The way I organize the show, and it's pretty hard to see the installation shots, but I use the entire installation as a reference to the mold. So one one side uh, was all put in the negative, and one was in the positive. I think maybe you can see that. Mirrors. Learned a lot from the 18th century. Of course, they didn't really use mirrors until later, but you know, I got interested in using mirrors um, from looking at um, other museum structures or, or exhibition displays where they had never used a mirror in um, at RISD. And these were dark rooms. These were, there was before electricity. So how to bring light into dark spaces, uh, reflected materials. I mean, I used you know see-through things. I used the floor. Um, I used the. These are part of a lot of what I did at the factory was using stuff that they threw out or wanted to throw out. And I won't go into the whole, unless somebody wants me to, the history of this material, but um, those would have been thrown out. I had an amazing little video that was from the turn of the century acting out. You can see the black and white there where um, it was the Berlin Expo where they're they're literally acting out the Meisen figures uh, at the expo, and uh, and so it, it was an awareness of how entertaining those things really were for people, and how much people were looking at them as little worlds and places to fantasize about. Okay, I'm almost finished, uh, um, and I am now working on this 20-year survey, um, and this is uh, a reminder for me that I should be back in the studio. Uh, but anyway, and over there, all the way on the right is where there's new work that is not finished. Uh, but all of these room, you know, be sort of chronological. Uh, this is the museum, the ICA Boston. It's amazing uh, museum, wonderful people there, and I'm very privileged to be doing that. Uh, this is working, like, I just thought it might be interesting to see, like, in order to imagine this and try to figure it out, just, you know, I'm making three-dimensional models, because I'm also um, doing most of the installation. Uh, by hooker, by crook, and uh, and you know, 3D modeling on the computer, and that's it. Thank you.
If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, Um, with the Meissen pieces that you're doing, some of them that you're showing in the installation, you had more of the, like the floral bits and the figurative things and the painting. Did you have people at Meissen do that or were you like the painting aspect and thing? That was really complicated. That's good that you're asking. Um, it was a little strange. Uh, I mean, this is an industrial factory and they didn't know where to draw the line once I started to go over the line uh, and ask to use their 300 year old molds, which, you know, over time uh, they granted me that. But with the painting, if I was using the blue to make a, it short, if for instance, if I was doing the blue and white onion pattern, which they believe is recognizable in the world as something from them, uh, they needed to paint it, literally, but I was never using it in the way that it was used because I was enlarging it, I was scrambling it, I was doing all kinds of things with it, but they still wouldn't let me paint it. In fact, they locked me in the studio once when they thought I was painting it. But the, the so what, I, what we came to I could draw, because you can draw in, pe in pencil on ceramic, and when you fire it, it fires out. So I could draw, and I became friendly with one of the painters who would actually follow my drawing, and I could sit with him while he painted it. That's for that. A lot of the other stuff, they let me paint. I mean, it was it was crazy. Like sometimes they would let me paint stuff that they shouldn't have, and you know, it was just random. They hadn't they hadn't dealt with that situation before, and so I, I was sympathetic. But you know, I was gonna try to do as much as I could. Um, so it was the same thing with the molds. Like they said when I s talked about the mold project, no outsider had ever been in the mold room. And so I petitioned, I did drawings of what I wanted to do. And uh, I had gone with my assistant, uh, who was a great mold maker, it turned out. I didn't know that at the time. Uh, and we just got, first of all, it was a guy. That was important. and we got them to agree they would let us into the mold room making something for one day you know and then i knew once we were in there we were okay as we were we were there for almost two years <laughs> so it was like that it was like constantly like where can we where can we go any other questions Hi. Um, Hi. I, sorry, I didn't, it feels weird to stand up. Um, I'm Yanni. Uh, you talk about being present and this idea of um, having a mindful studio practice. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if, or I'm curious about, um, do you see like the act of making as being a form of like self-actualization or like going through a pr the process? Or is it more just about like being here in this moment in the now? Um, or maybe both, I don't know. Self-actualization, yeah. what do you mean by that? Just like, I guess through the act of and process of making art is finding like your true purpose or like mm -hmm. what it, or understanding what it means to be a being mm -hmm. now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I don't think there is a self actually, you know, that's gonna get actualized. Uh, but I do think that, but it is true that making art is um, my discovery process for everything. So my, the studio is the site of 
my personal investigations, um, and that is always in flux. There is not going to be a point where that, you know, gets right. It's always going to be um, a fluid thing, and that 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 is something that I appreciate and uh, and pay attention to. Uh, so working with a kind of awareness uh, has created some rules where I, you know, won't do something, you know, that creates, that, that requires some, you know, far off in a distant, uh, outside of my body feeling that, uh, you know, I have no relationship to it in order to make a product. I'm not interested in that. So the studio is the laboratory for me understanding not just myself, but the world. Okay, any other questions? Hi, um, you mentioned not drawing before you build your farms. And so I was curious if having, like building this enormous library of glaze tests, mm -hmm. is that something you've, you had to do coming into the ceramics process? Is it very much like a decision you make? Like, because then the glaze tests kind of give you a preview of what would happen. Mm -hmm. A possible preview of what would happen. Because I, I will say that when you have a glaze test, and this is sort of an aside, when you have a glaze test, the nor the and it's, you're making something this big, then when you put it on something this big, the heat and the mass and the shape and all of those things will completely change what you do. But it, it was a requirement for me because I didn't want to just use glazes out of the bottle for some reason. Uh, you know, I guess, I just thought the whole thing was magic, that you could put these powders together. Uh, I mean, it is like a uh, earth, air, fire, recreating the birth of the universe every day. It's, it's very primal and interesting. So I like the idea of getting as deep into it as I can without it becoming totally fetishized. So it's not like I'm against, so sometimes I will do, use something out of the bottle, but I'll, it'll be mixed with some other stuff. So it is a sort of a requirement. I think like now when I go to ceramic departments, and I hadn't actually been in ceramic departments in a very, very long time, um, and I see people working on things, and then they have, a what's called a glaze room, and the glaze room are large vats of things with tiles, and if you dip in there, you're gonna get that. I don't subscribe to that idea. I think that that's a very unconsidered way of doing it, and a, and a way that uh, that, that, that's a holdover from being a production potter. So if you're making sculpture, if you're being a potter, okay, you know, and you come up with a glaze and you're gonna put that all over everything, of course you should have a vat. But if you're gonna be a sculptor, figure it out. Okay. Arlene, I, <clears throat> first I wanna thank you. I, I just said to my colleague here that was kind of the perfect artist talk. Oh, you gave us a lot to look at, oh. but you left us wanting more. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, really so. nice of you. But I, now I have a question, though. Okay, I, like, go the ahead. Qu the question is, and I might be wrong about this. I'm not sure myself. Yeah. But 
looking as you were going through the work, I was curious about how much it really fits, let's say, in terms of 20th century to the present, mm -hmm. what I guess I'd call a kind of Euro-Asian access vis-a-vis -vis sculpture, mm -hmm. and not so much American, like American sculpture. Like, it, it, mm -hmm. like, and I'm just curious about, like, as someone who comes from LA, like thinking about Otis Clay and Volkus and Ken mm -hmm. Price, and it's not really there for me, whereas your work could probably slip into a kind of survey of what's been interesting to European artists and artists throughout Asia over mm. the past 50, 60 years and work just fine. Whereas if I put it in a room with like the classics of American sculpture, the classes of American clay or American sculpture? Sculpture, I think, more generally. Okay. Just sort of post-war, you know, let's, you know, from David Smith to the present, let's mm, say. I love David Smith. Yeah, but, it, but it's kind of not there in the same way for me. Am I just not seeing it or, again, I'm not quite mm -hmm. convinced of this myself, but yeah. it just popped in my head. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I would have to say... Yeah, I'm interested to hear other people say that. I honestly had never, it was not a thought, I never asked myself that. And I just was looking at a David Smith at the Art Institute today. And uh, also, Asian sculpture, I don't think it looked like Asian sculpture. I have spent quite a lot of time in Asia, um, but I would say Asian contemporary sculpture, no. Mm. Uh, but I think that I decided in this like 20 year ago time that I, uh, being an artist doesn't have that many privileges, actually. <clears throat> and that I was going to make what the fuck I wanted. <laughs> uh, because that is the privilege. And that is the thing not to question. And that I don't feel that I need to fit into anything except my body and what feels right. And I don't feel either that that will be accepted universally and not criticized and not, and, and maybe be di even downright wrong on you know 100 different levels. And I am, I love art history and I love talking to artists about that. And I would love to talk to you more about it because I actually never question that particular, you know, space of what what is happening. Because I act, I think less and less there is a thing about what is happening. Maybe I'm imagining that. Uh, but I mean, now I'll tell you one thing that is happening is clay. Uh, and I expect it not to be happening again soon. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think things come and go and you just do what, what you do. And, you know, maybe I'm an Asian European woman. I don't know. <laughs> I'm definitely not a California person. And I definitely, and everything that was made in California I mean, I love all of the fetish finish stuff. I, ad I adore that. I wish I could be that person. I love, um, you know, I love some of the ceramics that came up during that time, but I really don't love a lot of it. You know, the abstract expressionist stuff, it's okay. But thank you for asking. Anything else? That was great, thank you. Really, really wonderful work. I had a question about the grotesque. So you showed 
your interest in the Neue Saklikite, the the Met show. Yeah. And that was a kind of grotesquerie that was very much related to the sociopolitical mm -hmm. moment mm -hmm. and then other things. And I'm wondering if you could talk more about your love of the grotesque. Yeah. Um, I do love, I do love, uh, I don't know if I just completely love the grotesque. I love that I can see it as beautiful. Uh, and that a couple of things. There's also humor that edges into the grotesque because humor has a lot to do with failure. So as you get like into like weird, ugly spaces, you get into failure and then you get into funny. And how those things, you know, weave together and then become beautiful, that, that's very rich for me. And I feel that all of that mirrors um, the human condition. And that those German painters were very attuned and people have always been very attuned to uh, the uh, tragic, humorous, pathetic version of life. And within the Buddhist uh, language, that's very present. Uh, I mean, some people say, oh, Buddhism is so depressing because it starts out with death. And so that's another, you know, way of thinking about it. But um, I, I find it just a rich vocabulary. And there is a concept, a Hindu concept called Leela. Uh, and uh, that is a kind of playing with what you, is given you. And often uh, I feel like it bridges the idea of going from a grotesque gargoyle to a clown, you know, and that that's, it, it, that, that's what they're talking about in that Hindu vocabulary. Um, so, uh, I don't particularly like ugly, but somehow within grotesque, like even those very, very, very tragic war drawings that Otto Dix did, and he was on site doing those drawings, you know, during the war, it is unflinching looking. It's just looking, it's just looking. So you're just looking it, do you need to make it polished? Do you need to make it beautiful? It's looking, but he's doing it so beautifully. He's making something so beautiful out of that really tragic thing that I'm very moved by it. Okay, thank you. Is there anything else? Okay, we wore you out. <laughs> Thank you so much.